Well, we appear to be in something of a quandary, don't we? Only to be expected, I suppose. Yes, but not tolerated. I've no intention of being defeated at this stage. We don't have to be. I mean, damn it, it's bad enough having someone who won't talk, but to have someone who can't. Well, I wouldn't say he can't. <laughs> and what would you say? I'd say it was all a matter of interpretation. You think you have the answer? I know someone who has. Good. Offer him plenty of money if he comes. I'll do better than that. I'll offer him plenty of pain if he doesn't. Yes, good, good. Better. After all, we don't want to be defeated at this stage, do we? <laughs> oh, well, I've made you laugh. That's a surprise. The Greek Interpreter by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised for radio by Jerry Jones. With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson. And featuring Peter Polycarpu as Mr Melas and John Hartley as Mycroft Holmes. With Peter Wickham, Gordon Reed, Joanna Myers and Ronald Herdman. The Greek Interpreter. It was after tea on a summer evening, and the conversation, which had roamed in a desultory, spasmodic fashion from golf clubs to the causes of the change in the obliquity of the ecliptic, came round at last to the question of atavism and hereditary aptitudes. The point under discussion was how far any singular gift in an individual was due to his ancestry and how far to his own early training. Exactly, Watson, exactly, the hereditary factor. Yeah, we are all of us affected by it. Uh, take, for example, my own strong facility for deduction. I thought that was due to systematic training, Holmes. Mm. To some extent, yes. Yeah, my ancestors were country squires who appear to have led much the same life as is natural to their class. But, nonetheless, my turn that way is in my veins, and may have come with my grandmother, who was the sister of Vernet, the French artist. Oh. Art in the blood is liable to take the strangest form. But how do you know that your gifts are hereditary? Well, because my brother Mycroft possesses them to an even greater degree than I do myself. Your brother? I don't remember you ever speaking of a brother. Nevertheless. Oh, I think you're just being modest, Holmes. My dear Watson, I cannot agree with those who rank modesty among the virtues. To underestimate oneself is as much a departure from truth as to exaggerate one's powers. When I say, therefore, that my brother Mycroft has better powers of observation than I, you may take it that I am speaking the truth. Yes, Holmes. Hmm, the exact and literal truth. Yes, Holmes. In fact, Watson, I suggest that instead of talking of my brother, I take you to see him. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find it quite an experience. Is he then your junior? No, no, seven years my senior. Mm. I'm just rather baffled as to why he's unknown. Oh, believe me, he's very well known in his own circle. And where is that? Well, for example, the Diogenes Club. Can't say I've heard of it. Huh? The Diogenes Club is quite the queerest club in London. And Brother Mycroft, one of the queerest of men. He's always there from quarter to five to twenty to eight. Why doesn't he use his powers for detective work? No, oh, he's incapable of it. But I thought you said... Uh... I said he was superior in observation and deduction. Now, if the art of the detective began and ended in an armchair, my brother would be the greatest criminal agent that ever lived. Mm. No ambition, then. No ambition. No energy. Now, he won't even go out of his way to verify his own solutions, and would rather be thought wrong than take the trouble to prove himself right. Now, again and again, I've taken a problem to him and received an explanation which has afterwards proved to be the correct one. And yet, he was absolutely incapable of working out the practical points which must be gone into before a case could be laid before a judge or a jury. Mm. Thank you, Cabby. The corner here will do. So, being professionally involved with crime is certainly not the case with your brother. It certainly is not. What is to me a means of livelihood is to him the merest hobby of a dilettante. Now, Mycroft lodges here in Pall Mall and walks round the corner into Whitehall every morning where he audits the books in some of the government's departments and then back every evening. From year's end to year's end, he takes no other exercise and is seen nowhere else except only in the Diogenes Club, which is just opposite his rooms. What sort of place is this Diogenes Club? 
Well, there are many men in London, Watson, who, for one reason or another, have no wish for the company of their fellows. Yet, they are certainly not averse to comfortable chairs and latest periodicals. It's for the convenience of these that the Diogenes Club was started, and it now contains the most unsociable men in town. I have myself found it a very soothing atmosphere. Yeah, and here we are, uh -huh. the club itself. And my brother will be waiting for us in the stranger's room. This way, Watson. Now then, this is the stranger's room. Ah. And it is, in fact, the only room in the club where one is allowed to speak. And that gentleman sitting in the corner there is Mycroft. Good Lord. Yes. As you can see, he's totally different from me in appearance. Stout, you mean, Holmes? I think he would prefer the word corpulent. <laughs> ah, he's seen us. Sherlock, dear boy, how nice to see you. And this, of course, is... Uh, My constant companion and dear friend, Dr. Watson. Of course. Delighted to meet you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Now, let us go and sit by the window. The chairs are sheer delight. Of course, I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became his chronicler, Dr. Watson. You're very kind. I hope I do him justice. In fact, Sherlock, my dear, I expected to see you around last week to consult me over that manor house case. Hmm? So why should I do that, Mycroft? Because I thought you might be a little out of your depth. <laughs> On the contrary, I solved it. It was Adams, of course. Yes, it was Adams. I was sure of it from the first. Now then, make yourselves comfortable. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> this is my favorite spot. Through this window, I see the world go by. I mean, just look at all the magnificent types out there. <laughs> Not a very happy lot, though, I have to say. I, on the other hand, enjoy myself just sitting back and watching them. See that chap out there? What do you make of him? Nothing at all, I'm afraid. What should I? You, Sherlock? What do you make of him? Hmm, an old soldier, I perceive. Very recently discharged, I'd say. He served in India, I see. As a non-commissioned officer. A royal artillery, I fancy. And a widower. But with a child. Children? Uh, children. Oh, 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 come now. This is a little too much. Well, surely it is not too hard to say that a man with that varying expression of authority and sunbaked skin is a soldier and more than a private not long from India. That he has not long left the service is shown by the boots he is still wearing. When he moved away to look in that shop window, he had not the cavalry stride. Yet he wore his hat on one side, as is shown by the lighter skin on that side of his brow. His weight is against being a sapper. He is in the artillery. Then, of course, his complete mourning shows that he has lost someone very dear. The fact that he is doing his own shopping looks as though it were his wife. You perceive also that he has been buying things for children. There is a rattle which shows that one of them is very young. The wife probably died in childbirth. That he has a picture book under his arm shows there is another child to be thought of. You see, Watson, hereditary. <laughs> By the way, Sherlock, I have something quite after your own heart. Hmm? A most singular problem submitted my judgment. I really hadn't the energy to follow it up, save in a very incomplete fashion. However, it gave me the basis for some pleasing speculation. If you would care to hear the facts. Mycroft, as well you know, I should be delighted. I've asked a certain Mr. Mellas to join us. He lodges on the floor above me, and I have some slight acquaintance with him which led him to come to me in his perplexity. Mr. Mellas is a Greek by extraction and a remarkable linguist. He earns his living partly as interpreter in the law courts and partly by acting as guide to any wealthy Orientals who may visit the Northumberland Avenue hotels. Uh, and even as I speak, here he comes. I will leave him to tell you his remarkable story himself. I feel in the need for a certain refreshment. I wish you well with the problem. And it was nice to have met you, Dr. Watson. And an education meeting you, sir. Farewell, Mycroft. Perhaps we shall meet again soon. You always know where I am. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Mellas, excuse my leaving, but I have a rather important matter with which I have to deal. Certainly, I understand. My brother sitting there is a gog to hear your tale. 
Mr. Holmes, I am very pleased to meet you. Very pleased. And thank you for giving me of your time. I'm afraid, Mr. Melas, that my name is Dr. Watson, the man to I am the man to whom you wish to speak, uh, Mr. Melas, and Dr. Watson here is my close friend and companion. <laughs> I apologize for the mistake. No apology needed, I assure you. I can't say I'm happy to be thought I look more like Mycroft's brother than you, Holmes. <laughs> I am anxious to hear your story, Mr. Melas. Of course, of course. Um, I must say that I, I do not believe that the police credit me on my word. That, I assure you, is of no matter. I usually find that what the police believe or do not believe is of no consequence. Your story, please. I am all attention. Well, then, it was Monday, two days ago, that it all happened. Um, I am an interpreter. I interpret all languages. Um, but as I am Greek by birth, it is with that particular tongue that I am most associated. Um, for many years, I have been the chief Greek interpreter in London, and my name is well known in the hotels. It happens not infrequently that I am sent for at strange hours by foreigners who have got into difficulties. It was no surprise, therefore, when on Monday evening uh, there was a knock at my door. Yes? Who is it? My name is Latimer. I wonder if I may have a word with you. Come in, please. You are Mr. Mellas? That is so. The Greek interpreter? Correct. But please, uh, won't you... Uh... Excuse me, Mr. Mellas, but I don't have time for social graces. But, my dear Mr... I have a carriage waiting for us outside. A carriage? But where... Please, Mr. Mellas, time is of the essence. But aren't I at least entitled to some explanation? <laughs> yes, of course. But I'll explain everything to you on the way then. The way where? Please, we must go. Now, a little explanation would not be out of order, I think. All I can say to you is that a Greek friend has come to see us upon business, and as he can speak nothing but his own tongue, the services of an interpreter are indispensable. Your name was recommended to us. Thank you. But are my services really needed at such speed? I'm afraid so. And where are we going? The house to which we're going is some little way off, in Kensington. Kensington? If you'll forgive me saying so, we seem to be taking a rather roundabout way of getting there. It would have been far better had we... What are you doing? Just pulling the blinds down at the windows. But why? So you don't know where you're going. I don't understand. And believe me, it's better that you don't. It might possibly be inconvenient if you could find your way back there again. I... I don't think I wish to go further with this affair. You have no choice, I'm afraid. What? Now try to resist, and I'll use such force on you as you'll regret your decision. My God. You're kidnapping me. Call it what you will, Mr. Mallows. However, on arrival at our destination, your task will be a simple one, and you will then be paid and released. Now, as the journey will take some time, I suggest you simply sit back and relax. Relax? In a carriage with shuttered windows and a, a man who threatens violence? Impossible. Just do your best, Mr. Mellors. Otherwise, we'll both find the journey something of a needless strain. This is really very extraordinary conduct. I presume you know that what you are doing is quite illegal. Yes, yes, yes. Something of a liberty, no doubt. But as I say, we'll make it up to you. I warn you, however, Mr. Mellis, that if at any time tonight you attempt to raise an alarm or do anything which is against my interest, you will find it a very serious thing. I'm finding it a very serious thing already. And I beg you to remember that no one knows where you are. No more do I. Just remember that while you're in the carriage or in my home, you are equally in my power. Now, as I say, sit back, relax. And so, Mr. Holmes, we drove for nearly two hours without me having the least clue as to where we were going. Uh, didn't the carriage wheels against the varying surfaces give some instruction? Well, sometimes the rattle of stones told of a paved causeway, and at others our smooth, silent course suggested asphalt. Good. But save for this variation in sound, there was nothing at all in the remotest way helpful in guessing as to where I was. However, it was a quarter past seven when we left Palmal, and my watch showed that it was ten minutes to nine when we at last came to a standstill. 
Latimer then removed the blinds from the windows. And what did you manage to see? Mm, very little, I'm afraid. I was rushed from the carriage and in seconds I found myself inside the house. But would you say it was in the countryside? Well, I did get a glimpse of trees and a lawn, but whether it was private grounds or bona fide country, I couldn't say. Yeah. So you then entered the hut? Yes. Uh, there was a coloured lamp inside, which was turned so low I could see little in the hall, save that it was hung with pictures. Then a door opened, and a very mean-looking individual came towards us. Although, in many ways, he could be described as a laughing man, owing to the fact that he had a, a frequent nervous laugh. Uh, and what did this laughing man say? Well, well. And is this Mr. Mellis, Harold? This is he. Well done, well done. No ill will, Mr. Mellis, I hope, but we could not get on without you. If you deal fair with us, you'll not regret it, but if you try any tricks, <laughs> then God help you. What do you want with me? Only to ask a few questions of a Greek gentleman who is visiting us and to let us know his answers. But say no more than you were told to say, or <laughs> you had... Better never to have been born. So, Mr. Mellis, this way. You too, Harold. We'll soon get this matter settled. Here we are. And there is the gentleman of whom we wish you to ask some questions. My God! Do not concern yourself as to his welfare. But, but why is his face crisscrossed with sticking plaster, even his mouth? Have you the writing slate there, Harold? Yes, it's here. And I've untied his hands. Give him the pencil, then. Now then, Mr. Mellis, you are to ask him the questions and he will write down the answers. Ask him first if he is prepared to sign the papers. Well, Mr. Holmes, in spite of the extraordinary situation, I did as I was asked, and the poor devil wrote down never. I asked him if there were any conditions that would change his mind, and he wrote... Only if I see her married in my presence by a Greek priest whom I know. Oh, when I informed what I describe as the laughing man of these answers, he gave one of his venomous laughs and said, Say to him he knows what to expect then. Uh. I can only say that the man appeared to care nothing for himself. Again and again I was told to ask him if he would give in and sign the documents. Again and again I had the same reply. Then... I had a happy thought. Hmm? I took to adding on little sentences of my own to each question. No one except the poor man and myself knew what was happening. Our half-spoken, half-written conversation went something like this. You can do nothing by this obstinacy. Who are you? I care not. I am a stranger in London. Your fate is in your own hands. How long have you been here? So we eat three weeks. The property can never be yours. What ails you? I'll never give it to villains. They are starving me. If you sign, you can go free. What house is this? I'll never sign. I don't know. You are not doing her any service. What is your name? Let me hear her say so. Kratithis. You'll see her if you sign. Where are you from? Then I'll never see her. Athens. Another five minutes, Mr. Holmes, and I would have wormed out the story under their very noses. So what was the happening that prevented your worming, as you describe it? Well, unfortunately, at that moment, the door suddenly opened and a woman came into the room. Harold, please, I could not stay away longer. It is so lonely up there with only... Oh, my God! It's Paul! These last words she spoke in Greek, and as she did so, the man who had brought me there grabbed her and began pushing her from the room. At the same time, the man I had been interrogating uh, managed to pull some of the sticking plaster from his lips. Filthy! Filthy! Get her out! Sleep me! No! No! Let me near her! And you! Get Come out of here! Come on! Quick! Answer! For a moment, I was left alone. I thought, perhaps this is my chance to have a look around, get some kind of clue as to where I was. Before I could do anything, however, the door opened again. Oh, dear. I must ask you to excuse all the drama. But as you perceive, we have taken you into our confidence over some very private business. <laughs> mm. 
We would not have bothered you, but our friend who began these negotiations, a friend who, of course, speaks Greek, has been forced to return to the East. Mm. It was quite necessary for us to find someone to take his place, and we were fortunate in hearing of your powers. Now then, Mr. Mellis, you are free to go. Well, I, Here are I, five I, sovereigns, uh, which will, I hope, be a sufficient fee for your pains. Well, I... But remember, if you speak to a living soul about this, one human soul, well, may God have mercy on your soul. We shall know if you do speak of it. We have our means of information. Now, as I say, that is all. You will find the carriage waiting for you outside, and my friend Harold will see you on your way. But do remember that silence is golden if you value your life. I was hurried through the hall and into the vehicle, obtaining once more that momentary glimpse of trees and the garden. Mr. Latimer took his place beside me once more, and we travelled in silence for what seemed an age. The whole thing was most extraordinary. I had arrived at that conclusion myself, Mr. Mellas. Then what happened? Well, after what seemed an interminable distance, the carriage suddenly pulled up. Well, Mr. Mellis, this is it. You will now get down. I am sorry to leave you so far from your house. Again, may I say that to speak of this evening will be greatly to your disadvantage, and any attempt to follow the carriage in any way whatsoever can only lead to injury to yourself. I think your message is quite clear, Mr. Latimer. Good. Then I wish you good night. Well, this is a very pretty state of affairs. Hello? Uh, hello? Who is that? Are you all right, sir? I'm not sure. Are you a railway porter? Well, that's right, sir. I'm on my way home. Where am I? Are you sure you're all right, sir? Yes, yes. Where is this place? Wandsworth Common, sir. Oh. Can I get a train into town? Well, you, you can if you walk a mile or so into Clapton Junction. Bit of luck. You'll still be in time for the last train to Victoria. Thank you so much for your help. No, not at all, sir. Good night. So, that was the end of my adventure, Mr. Holmes. I had no idea where I had been or who it was I'd met. All I know is that there is foul play going on, and I want to help that poor, unhappy man I interviewed. Yeah. I told the whole story to Mr. Mycroft Holmes the following morning, and subsequently the police. Uh, and what steps were taken? Well, I did place an advertisement in the Daily News. Ah, Mycroft, you returned. Mr. Mellas has just finished telling us his story. So I anticipated. And having heard it once, you had no wish to sit through it again? No need to be embarrassing, my dear. Any thoughts? Mm, not as yet. Well, the matter does have some... Distinguishing uh, features? Exactly. Mm. Tell me, Mycroft, what did your advertisement in the Daily News say? Well, if my memory serves me right, I said... Anybody supplying any information as to the whereabouts of a Greek gentleman named Paul Cratides from Athens, who is unable to speak English, will be rewarded. A similar reward paid to anyone giving information about a Greek lady whose first name is Sophie. Your memory is perfect. Thank you. I have the letter here to prove it. In fact, that advertisement went into all the dailies, not just the news. And no answer? None. How about the Greek legation? I inquired. They know nothing. Ah, then how about a wire to the head of the Athens police? Oh, my dear, it's so plain that you're the one in the family with all the energy. <laughs> well, take the case up by all means, and let me know if you do any good. Mm, certainly, I'll let you know, and Mr. Mellas also. In the meantime, Mr. Mellas, mm. I should be on my guard if I were you. But, of course, having seen the advertisements, they now know you've betrayed them. You see, Watson, 
Our evening has by no means been wasted. Uh, an interesting character, that brother of yours, Holmes. Yes, some of my most interesting cases have come to me in this way through Mycroft. And you both think this one has some distinguishing features? Oh, indeed it has. You have hopes of solving it? Well, knowing as much as we do, it will be singular indeed if we fail to uncover the rest. Yes, I suppose so. Well, surely you yourself have formed some theory which will explain the facts of which we've listened. Well, in a vague way, yes. Yeah, one moment, Watson. I intend to enter this telegraph office and send off a few wires. Uh, in the meantime, see if you can get a cab for us. Are you interested in my theory, Holmes? What? Oh, oh, uh, uh, yes, do, do carry on. Well, <clears throat> and knowing as much as we do, as you said, it seems to me obvious that this Greek girl named Sophie has been carried off by that chap Harold Latimer. He was obviously intent on getting our money. Mm, carried off, you say? Carried off from where? Athens, perhaps? No, I think I think not. This Harold Latimer could not speak a word of Greek. Mm. The lady, on the other hand, could speak English fairly well. Inference, she had been in England for some time, but he had not been in Greece. In that case, let us presume that she had come on a visit to England and that Harold Latimer had somehow persuaded her to come away with him. Mm, that is more probable. Then her brother, that I fancy was the relationship between her and the fellow band and gagged, came out from Greece to interfere in the matter. He imprudently puts himself at the mercy of Latimer and his associates. You, you refer to the man with the unfortunate laugh? Yes. They seize him and use violence towards him in order to make him sign some papers handing over the girl's fortune, of which he may be trustee, to them. Oh, jolly good, Watson, jolly good. Uh, uh, this he refuses to do. In order to negotiate with him, they have to get an interpreter. Having tried one man, they next land upon a Mr. Malas. The girl is not told of the arrival of her brother and finds out quite by accident when she enters the room unexpectedly. <laughs> Excellent, Watson. Ah, here we are. Uh, thank you, cabby. This will do. Hey, you now, my dear fellow, I'm quite impressed. Now, I really fancy that you're not far from the truth. Well, we seem to hold all the cards and we have only to fear some sudden act of violence on their part. Mm. Now, I believe that if they give us time, then we have them. But how do we find out where the house is? Well, where it lies exactly? Uh, so our conjecture is correct, and the girl's name is, or was, Sophie Cratides. We shall have no difficulty in tracing her. Yeah, the brother, unfortunately, is a complete stranger to the country. Yeah, it's clear that some time has elapsed since this Harold Latimer established relations with the girl, for her brother in Greece has had time to hear of it and come across here. Now, if they'd been living in the same place during this time, it's probable that we shall have an answer to Mycroft's advertisement. Well, home at last. Come along in, Sherlock. Mycroft? Yes, tis I. You didn't expect such energy from me, did you? Why are you here? Somehow, this case attracts me. Well, how did you get here? Actually, I passed you in a hansom while you were going into a telegraph office. But please, make yourselves at home. Thank you, my dear. How kind. Now then, there have been some new developments. There's been an answer to the advertisement. Exactly. Ah. It came, in fact, within moments of your leaving. Mm, to what effect? Here it is, written with a J pen on royal cream paper by a middle-aged man with a weak constitution. Mm. Sir, it says... In answer to your advertisement of today's date, I beg to inform you that I know the young lady in question very well. If you should care to call upon me, I could give you some particulars as to her painful history. She is living at present at the Myrtles Beckenham. Yours faithfully, J. Davenport. He writes from Lower Brixton. Do you think that we might drive to him, Sherlock, and learn these particulars? And Mycroft! The brother's life is more important than the sister's story. I think we should call at Scotland Yard for Inspector Gregson and go straight out to Beckenham. We know the brother's life's in danger and every hour may be vital. Good Lord, Holmes, are we off again already? We are indeed. And we'd better pick up Mr. Mellas on the way. We may need an interpreter. I'll send the boy for a four-wheeler and we'll be on our way. Wonderful to observe him, isn't it, Watson? One moment, I'll get him. Tell him not to bother with coats and such. Just get him straight in here. Try to relax for a second, Sherlock. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Mrs. B. I've just come to collect Mr. Mellas. I'm afraid he's gone out, sir. Oh, dear. Uh, can you tell me where? 
Oh, I, I don't know, sir. I only know he drove away with a gentleman in a carriage. And could you describe this gentleman? He was a, a little gentleman with glasses. Thin in the face he was, sir. And he gave no name? Uh, no, sir. He was quite a pleasant gentleman, though, in many ways. Oh, yes, quite pleasant. Was he indeed? Yes, sir. He had this funny way of laughing all the time he was talking. Uh, this is getting very serious. These men have got hold of Melas again. Now, he's a man of no physical courage, as they're well aware from their experience the other night. Whoever called on him was able to terrorise him the instant he got into his presence. Yes. No doubt they want his professional services. But having used him, they may be inclined to punish him for what they will regard as his treachery. Indeed. He's in great danger. But I'm inclined to think that... But we, we ought to take the train to Beckenham, as it's quicker, quicker than, than this carriage. carriage. The words right out of my mouth, as usual, brother. First, however, it's Scotland Yard and Inspector Gregson. Inspector, I have to warn you that I'm in grave danger of losing my temper. I thought you already had. I mean, lose it completely. And what good would that do? Yeah, Inspector, how long is it since I arrived at Scotland Yard? I've no idea. Well, then I'll tell you. One hour and two minutes. All that time wasted in trying to get you to sign that blessed piece of paper. Now, be fair, Mr. Holmes. You couldn't even get hold of me for the first half hour or so. Nevertheless, Inspector, please, I beg you, sign that form so that we can get into the house. Yeah. Take it easy. You'll have a heart attack. Don't you realise a man may be dead because of your refusal to sign? Now, when did I say that I refused, exactly? It's just that matters of this kind have to be studied. We can't go letting any Tom, Dick or Harry into people's houses, can Don't we? This is unbearable. I shall have to report it. Relax, sir. I'll sign. But you do understand how careful we have to be? Ah, tea. Just the very thing. <sighs> well, Inspector, at long, long last, the Myrtles. Not a very inviting looking place, I must say. Well, let's all get out and begin, shall we? I think we can send the carriage away, don't you, Sherlock? Yeah, good idea. Uh, out we get then. Yeah. Uh, sleep, are you, Watson? Thoughtful, Holmes. Thoughtful. All right, Cabby. Oh, oh, that will be all. We won't require your services further. Right, good night, sir. Well, now, what have we here? A deserted house, by the look of it. Mm, and the windows are certainly all dark. Yes, our birds have flown and the nest empty. Why are you so sure? Oh, you see, just there, a carriage heavily loaded yeah. with luggage has passed this way during the past hour. Well, I can see the wheel tracks, but where does the luggage come in? Well, you see... May the... I, dear boy? Yeah. Yeah. You see, Inspector, you may uh. be observing the same wheel tracks going the other way, yeah. but the outward-bound ones are very much deeper, so much so that, as my brother says, there was obviously uh. considerable weight on the carriage. My brother is, of course, perfectly correct. Always think you know the answer, don't you, sir? Well, not point in thinking one knows, Inspector. The trick is to know one knows. I wonder, Holmes, if I might whisper Norbury in your ear. What? Norbury. Oh, oh yes. Uh, thank you, Watson. Now then, the door. Well, it's not going to be an easy one to force by the look of it. Still, if we can't get anyone to hear us, we'll uh, give it a try. All right. I've got this window open. Have you indeed? Well, it's a mercy that you're on the side of the force and not against it, Mr. Holmes. Well, I think under the circumstances we may enter without an invitation. Come on, now. Oh. Now, just one moment now while I light my lamp. There. Now, what have we here? Two glasses, an empty brandy bottle, and the remains of a meal. What was that? Uh, what? Wait, 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 wait. It's upstairs. Come on. That's what come on. It's coming from in there. The door's locked. Yeah. Stand aside, Watson. I'll fling myself at it, see what happens. 
That's what happens. Nothing. Now let me try. No, let me try, my dear inspector. My bulk on this occasion is somewhat in my favor. Now, good man. Now, I'm going in. <laughs> it's charcoal. Right. Give it time, it'll clear. Oh, God, what did you say it was? My brother said it was charcoal, Inspector. <laughs> Not the most pleasant of aromas. Stand back, back from the door. It'll get better. But will my shoulder, I ask myself. Did you see anything, Holmes? Ah, I didn't have time, I'm afraid. Yeah, so what now? Well, so now I'll go back in and try and get the window open. Do you need help? Now, thank you, but no. We don't get crashing into each other. On the other hand, you could hold your lamp at the door. It right. may give me some light. All right, then. Here I go. No, but take care. Don't take any risks. No, I'll do my best, Inspector. Right then. Uh. <laughs> oh, what's happening, Holmes? I've, I've got the window open. Rather good at opening windows, isn't it? There's a sort of tripod <coughs> thing here that the fumes are coming out of. Come on, yourself, Sherlock. Give yourself some air. <laughs> no, no, I'm throwing you out of the window. <laughs> Holmes, for heaven's sake, you'll suffocate. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. I threw it out. Uh, now, what? Uh, what can you see? Uh, there are two bodies here in the corner. Uh, go on. Don't come in now, but be quick. <laughs> yes, yes. They're tied up. Just drag them out. Just drag them. Uh, that's it. Come on. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good Lord, Holmes. Look at the state of them. Yeah, it's not surprising, really. Blue-lipped, swollen, congested faces. <laughs> Poor devils. But who are they? Who can tell? Are they alive, Doctor? Well, this one certainly isn't. Eyes popping out of his head, dead some time. Excuse me interfering, but isn't that sticking plaster around his mouth? Yes, you're right. So this must be... Uh... The Greek gentleman who was given such an appalling time. The brother of Sophie. But he came too late. Pity. Yes, and this other poor soul must be mad at uh, Could be anybody by the look of him. It uh, seems they gave him quite a beating up before subjecting him to that dreadful charcoal poison. Uh, well, well, one day we didn't recognise uh, him. Nasty business, Holmes. Very nasty. Uh, yeah. Wait! <laughs> what is it? He's still alive! Melas is still alive! Look! His eyes. You're right. Let's get him downstairs. See what we can do. I know precisely what we can do. Ammonia and brandy. Exactly. I could do with a little brandy myself, as a matter of fact. And how are you feeling now, Mr. Merlas? I have to confess, uh, dreadful. Yes, yes, but alive. Yes, thanks to you uh, and your friend. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were not in time to save the other gentleman. Oh, I am so sorry. Well, now, if you're feeling up to it, perhaps you could tell me what happened. Well, Watson, my dear fellow, the story he told was very much as we had thought. Yeah. That laughing gentleman, as we know, called at Mayor Lass's home and threatened instant death if he did not come with them at once to Beckenham and once more attempt to get the Greek gentleman, Paul Kratides, to sign the papers. Death was threatened to both if the papers were not signed. In spite of everything, Kratides refused to sign. Then Merlas was reproached in no uncertain manner for his treachery with regard to the newspaper advertisement. He was then stunned with a heavy blow and remembers nothing more until he began to come round and found us all bending over him. Yes, it's a great shame we were too late to help poor Paul Kratides. After coming all the way from Greece to save his sister from Latimer and his laughing friend, he deserved a better fate. And what do you suppose has been the fate of the sister? Well, who knows? Well, obviously, she's still a prisoner of Latimer and his associate, and they've taken her away somewhere. And that's that. Yes, I guess so, yes. Not a very satisfactory ending to things, really. No, indeed not. Well, we can only hope that time provides a better curtain. Park in London. Found a bird. <laughs> Ideal day. <laughs> You're certainly in a very good mood today, Holmes. It's a pleasure to see it. Oh, it's one or some shining picnic with a dear friend. Moments to treasure. It's just that since that Greek interpreter business, you've been rather low in spirit. Yes, Watson. But now I have an ending to that particular story. What do you mean, Holmes? 
Come on. What have you heard? <laughs> Explain. Certainly. You're mistaken, you know. If you think you can get away with what you have done. And you don't have to keep that gun pointed at me. Just keep your mouth shut. My friend is sleeping. And I'm glad that laugh of his drives me to distraction. Quiet, I said. And don't look at me like that. You killed my brother. How should I look? And I'll kill you if you go on talking. Very brave, aren't you? Do you think I won't kill you? Oh, I'm sure you could. You've killed once, you could do it again. That's the difference between us, you see. I could never kill anyone, whatever the situation. <laughs> yes, you could. Don't fool yourself. Oh, no. That's where you are wrong. I don't have that will in me, thank God. You think you're something special, don't you? No. I'm not special. Just a human being. Are you telling me that if somehow you managed to get hold of the gun, you wouldn't use it? Not even to save your own life? Not even to revenge the murder of your own brother? No, never. Sorry to disappoint you. I don't believe you, Sophie. That's because we are different people. And I truly thank God for it. All right, then. Look, I'll give you the gun. I'll give it to you. How about that? Uh, I don't want it. Sorry, I don't want it. No, take it. I said I don't want it. You can't make me what I am not. Take it. And then, as you're such an angel, you can give it back to me, can't you? I don't want to even touch it. Keep the damn thing. There. There we are. It's yours. A gift from me to you. Now then, my angel, let me see you give it back. Come on. Come on. Impress me. What? Oh, what's happening? And now it's your turn, my laughing friend. God, you've killed him. That's right. Sorry to waken you. Still, you can have a nice long sleep now. Oh, no, no, wait. And now you've had your last laugh. <laughs> Never trust a Greek bearing gifts. And is that story true? I received it from Sophie herself. She contacted me a day ago. I see no reason to disbelieve her. But why did she tell you? Personal favor, she said, to tidy things up. She's now gone back home to attempt a new start to her life. I wished her well. So, for a day or two, I can now relax and enjoy myself. You realize, of course, Holmes, that we really should report our confession to the police. Which confession is that, Watson? The one the Greek girl made to you. Which Greek girl is that? Oh, I see. Good. There are certainly times, my dear Holmes, when you prefer to adopt a certain loss of memory. I don't know what you are talking about. You see what I mean? Oh, don't spoil the picnic, Watson. I'm having such a lovely day. You're still wrong, though, aren't you? Well, now, as you would say, old friend, it's rather open to discussion. But I say, let's open the hamper. In The Greek Interpreter... Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams. With Peter Polycarpo as Mr. Melas, John Hartley as Mycroft Holmes, Peter Wickham as Latimer, Gordon Reed as the Laughing Man, Joanna Myers as Sophie, Neil Roberts as her brother, and Ronald Herdman as Inspector Gregson. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Greek Interpreter was dramatised for radio by Jerry Jones and directed by Enid Williams. <laughs>